the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for this day, for the beautiful weather, and the opportunity to spend time in your Psalms this evening. Open our hearts and minds to learn how to make our heart a home for your word. And we lift up to you, uh, Deborah Zeman and Marianne's daughter-in-law's mother, who are both uh, coming to the end of their lives. We entrust both of them to your care. And we ask that you be with their families during this difficult time so that they know that all people who have faith in you already have eternal life and that this is just going to be a passing moment compared to eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Psalm 119. Uh, we're going to do the second section tonight. Um, again, for those of you that might have missed it, uh, Psalm 119 is one of a group of psalms uh, called an acrostic. What an acrostic is, is it has uh, different sections of the poem uh, all start with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And Psalm 119, being made up of being the longest chapter in the Bible, being made up of 22 sections, I believe it is, uh, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So each section has one letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Verses 1 to 8, the beginning of each verse starts with the Hebrew letter Aleph. And tonight we'll do 9 through 16, and it will start with the Hebrew letter Beth. Uh, and the Hebrew letter Beth can also stand for the word house. So uh, many people have suggested that uh, since this section, every verse starts with B, which can also be the word house, that it is a section that teaches us how to make our hearts a home for the word of God. So beginning in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 9. But that doesn't translate into our alphabet. Not at all. Not remotely. We're <laughs> looking at those verses. Right. The, yeah, there's nothing. There is no, no. correlation between right. English and Hebrew. Uh, plus, Hebrew poetry is not remotely like our poetry. Like, you know, we think great poetry, we think of, you know, Shakespeare and iambic pentameter and those kind of constructions. Uh, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, right? But Hebrew poetry, there is no rhyming. Uh, there is no meter. It's the, the way they play topics against each other and the way they arrange the words uh, that creates the poetry. It's not any kind of poetry like we're used to. Uh, so if you're not actually studying Hebrew poetry, it's almost not worth talking about because it, we can't relate to it unless we actually spoke the language. And what, um, what, um, 119 has all these uh, little sections. What's the section that we're on? What's what? What's the section that we're on? Uh, the B, the second one. Beth? Yes. Okay, so again, the letter Beth uh, can also mean a house. So uh, a lot of interpreters um, have said that this section teaches us how to make our heart a home uh, for the word of God. So Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Now this section has a lot of those words we talked about last week that are the big themes for this psalm, which is the word of God. So you have commandments, you have testimonies, you have ordinances, you have statutes, and then of course you have your word. So you have all these different words for the word. And again, when when they talk about the law, you know, I delight in your law, like Psalm 1 talks about, uh, it's not just when we as Lutherans think of or, or as uh, Protestants think of the law being 
the thing we cannot keep, you know, the Ten Commandments. Uh, that is not what in, in uh, the Semitic mind that they are referring to. They're actually talking to law and gospel. They're just talking about scripture. So not just strictly the law. Although the Pharisees do get a little carried away turning it into the law. So, how can a young man cleanse his way? That's probably an interesting question for us today because apparently it was not any different back then than it is for people now. You know, how are we to be able to live a pure and chaste life? And that's even a question that people today might not even ask themselves. They might not even give that a thought in the permissive society in which we live. Uh, so we don't really, as a, as a whole, do not concern ourselves with moral purity. And we can see that written large in our media. We can see how permissive it has become. Uh, St. Augustine once prayed before he became a Christian, and he prayed to God, Lord, please make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> So there's the early Middle Ages. So the, the problem has always existed. And then the world, of course, tells us, you know, have a good time while you're young. You can settle down. There will be time for all that later. Uh, then you can settle down, be religious, be a proper person, focus on prayer. But God's answer is different. God says if you're going to live for God, you have to begin at the beginning, at your beginning, without delay, from your youth. So even when we as Christians want to be morally pure, there are a lot of things that make it difficult to do. Uh, when we're young, of course they say, you know, when we're young, a man's sins are always of the carnal nature when he's young. That's just what young men think about and they have a lack of wisdom. They have a desire for independence, and they're trying to obtain that. Uh, and then, of course, with human beings, our physical and sexual maturity runs ahead of maturity in other matters, particularly uh, morality or spirituality. And then you get a little older, now you have your own money, and you can come and go as you please. And that freedom leaves you free to do things that you probably maybe should not be doing. And then you have, you know, we can't let young women off the hook. They may knowingly or unknowingly encourage impurity by their actions, by their speech. I'm no different than men. I mean, I'm not putting, that makes it sound like I'm blaming women for things that happen. That's not what I'm talking about. It's just we as a society have allowed anybody to walk around kind of half naked anymore if you look. Like, what are these people thinking when they leave the house? And then that becomes commonplace, and then suddenly our, as a society, our moral values start to decrease, don't they? And we've seen that. Look at the evolution of bathing suits. I'm not going to harp on clothing tonight at all, but you look at the evolution of bathing suits. A bathing costume was, looked like a long johns, right? You were covered from like your neck to your ankles. And now it's hardly uh, clothing. You know, and then our, you know, just the spirit of our age uh, promotes this lack of morality uh, because you are free to do whatever you want. But this is nothing new. This is the same thing that happened in biblical times. In fact, in morning prayer this morning, we're reading in uh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, the account of Nathan coming to David for what David did to one of his soldiers in battle so that he could have his wife. Well, actually, he had his wife first, and then he had him killed. So everybody knows that story, right? It's the story of Psalm 51, how that came to be. You know, so he saw this girl bathing and thought she looked pretty good, so I'm the king, right? Uh, and then he had Nathan, God had Nathan come to him and you know, explained to him with a parable, and Nathan was outraged at this parable about this sheep. 
and said, okay, yeah, this guy, you know, this guy needs to be put to death, and he has to pay back, you know, four times what he did. And Nathan says, yeah, that's you. He goes, oh, okay, I understand. You know, so even back then, we have the exact same problems. It's just it's human nature. But we might say it's particularly difficult today because, again, society has become so permissive that you are the fossil, you are the throwback if you disagree with other people's freedoms to be and act like this and behave in that way. I would say so, yeah, I think so. Um, mostly because I think some of the imagery that we've been given of what Rome was like is a little exaggerated, um, a, a little. Okay, they were pretty decadent society and so were the Greeks. Um, uh, particularly with, they were probably more decadent than we were with, maybe not today, but you know, a generation or two ago with homosexuality, it was, accepted as long as you didn't talk about it. So everybody did it, but nobody talked about it. Uh, men would do that with young boys uh, to usher them into manhood or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it was just, or that's what they called it, to, to uh, make that behavior acceptable, but you didn't let people know you did it. It was one of those, you just didn't talk about it. Uh, so in that aspect, they were probably more decadent than we are, but with the, uh, like orgies and all that kind of stuff we see in like old gladiator movies or what have you. Uh, yeah, that's a little exaggerated, but uh, they had the same problems we have today, prostitution, uh, sex trafficking, uh, especially with slavery. Uh, so yeah, in some ways we would look at them and say, yeah, they're more decadent than we are. But then I wonder if they came to our century and looked around and went, you gotta be kidding me, how do, you guys are doing what? And you go out of the house like that? It's just things that uh, you didn't do. Uh, you know, for example, in Rome, you wore a certain color. That's how people knew you were a prostitute and what part of town you were in uh, and the cork high heels that they wore. So you knew, okay, she's the lady of the evening. And then all of a sudden, the affluent women started copying that fashion and it became fashion. And next thing you know, everybody's dressing, wearing uh, uh, saffron robes and wearing high cork shoes and all of a sudden, okay, these are all uh, prominent women in society. These are not prostitutes. What's going on? Everything becomes permissive. It just becomes part of the norm. Uh, so I would say they would be very shocked by some of the stuff that goes on and they probably think we're very backwards about other things. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so it goes, it goes throughout history as just Young people, carnal appetites. That's, that's our fallen human nature. We weren't created to be that way, but that is the way we are after the fall. So, what does the young man do? How does he keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Well, so God gives them his word to help keep his way pure. So he wants to spare, God wants to spare us the bondage of sin. You know, if you fall into these behaviors, it's very hard to fall out of them again. Sometimes we're talking to uh, people who work with sex addiction. That is as destructive an addiction as drugs, I would say, as far as to your life. Not that uh, you're harming your body the way drugs do, but you are harming your ability to ever have a normal relationship with another person. Uh, or with uh, pornography, which they had back then too. Uh, one of my seminary friends was very active in the you know, anti-pornography movement, especially for young men. Uh, in the studies that they've shown, even as that has become more permissive, as you know, because everybody has the internet, and this stuff is freely available, and 
you know, it's like any other drug, the first hit is free, and they try to entice you to the stuff you have to pay for. Uh, and he said what happens when working with these people who are addicted to that media, it affects every aspect of their lives, especially their relationships with women because they can't have, and women also uh, consume pornography also. In fact, almost half of it is consumed by women, if you can believe that. Uh, and what they found is that it has, you know, it's numbed the mind to the point that you have to find the newest, latest, most disgusting, perverted stuff to be turned on by. Uh, so you can't have just a relationship with an ordinary person of the opposite sex that's not, it doesn't even engage your limbic system. It doesn't engage you on that level. It's just, it's like, uh, it's like a burn victim that has had his nerve endings destroyed so he can't feel pain anymore. You just, you can't feel anything, you're numb. Uh, completely numb to, to normal interpersonal relationships. So with that, as a society, and that's becoming worldwide, uh, it's a huge problem. Uh, so what, what is this young man to do? Or what are we to do to help this young man? Right, the young man in the song. And that's to not be afraid, I think, to talk about this stuff. Uh, sometimes it's a little weird talking about older folks, uh, but with older folks about it, because older people's drives are not in that uh, direction. Uh, it's a, usually a younger person's sin, but we can talk. We have to not be afraid to talk to the younger people about it. That these are the repercussions that this kind of stuff has. Um, because once they start uh, dabbling in it, it's too late. It can be too late. Uh, some people might try it and think it's not for them, but uh, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of of young men especially, especially go away to college, you don't have anybody looking over your shoulder, consume this product that um, is designed to destroy your interpersonal relationships. And we have to not be afraid, I think, to talk about that, frankly, with people, even though it's a never a comfortable thing to talk about sometimes. I do as appropriate, you know. Like next year, I don't, I'm not sure if I have anybody here this year, but next year I've got four girls, which actually makes it a little better because it's all girls instead of a mix because then it's awkward. And it's awkward. Any of the Six Commandments stuff is awkward in confirmation. It just is. Uh, but then there too, you can see the parents who have talked to them about this kind of stuff and they're not, they don't shy away from it. I mean... <clears throat> They're, they're able to engage it as, you know, an issue that's something that comes up. I asked a, a young man, turns out us talk to them. He had a drug problem, but I, I asked him to teach me a drug addict. How do you become a drug addict? Because he was, I knew him before. And he said, you usually get started, the first time you do, you're usually in a down mood. You know, you're not feeling good, or mm -hmm. somebody kicked you off, or things just aren't going well. And you try it for a, you know, to just to feel better. And he said, for the rest of your life, you're chasing that, you're chasing that initial high. Mm -hmm. That's how you become a drug addict. I didn't understand it. He was, I appreciated his honesty. In fact, I think I was, he was shocked when I said, teach me an addict. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's why so many people overdose, because they're trying to hit that feeling, and it's kind of like you never, it's you never as good as the first time. time. So they chase after harder, harder drugs, more drugs, combining drugs, and it has, you know, obviously devastating results. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, uh, this pornography issue in our society is absolutely huge and, and working with my friend and some of the online resources you look at, the way they're marketing it to our children is absolutely appalling. And it's targeting younger and younger children because now it's cartoons, it's explicit animation because all the kids are into anime. And so now let's add a pornographic angle to the animation that they already like and that's a doorway into all the other horrible stuff that's out there. Uh, 
and I really think it's being marketed to younger and younger people, and it's being marketed to girls too. It's not just not just the boys. So we have to not be afraid to engage on that uh, because it's just like just like chasing that high. You start trying to chase that feeling. You are never going to be able to have a normal relationship with another person. It's going to be very, 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 very difficult. Uh, especially the people that go down this rabbit hole very deeply and they spend years, decades in it. Uh, it's, you, you wonder how these people have time for all this, but it's really, it, it becomes all consuming, all consuming. And it turns into exactly that, an addiction. It's just something you do and you don't even feel anything anymore. You just have to do it, you have to keep doing it. Right, so we have to be, I think we have to be frank and we have to, you know, show, you know, number one, why God shows us what his model for, of course, got a wedding Saturday, so thinking about, you know, God's model for relationships between a man and a woman, one man, one woman, for the purpose of enjoying each other, helping each other, and making the next generation of people. But that, you know, that enjoying each other sexually is, can't shy away from telling people that either, because that's, that's what marriage is for. That is what you are supposed to experience with that person. And if it's try it before you buy it with umpteen partners, that also is going to be really difficult. And even trying to teach our young people about why you shouldn't live together before you get married, which is almost like barking up a tree, right? Mm -hmm. Anymore today, because that's become the norm. Well, we want to see if we're compatible. But even when you do that, the divorce rates are just as high. It's about 50% with whether you live together first or not. So that's not really a, a thing. Um, yeah. Then I was going somewhere and I just blanked. Oh, one of the things I actually do with people with premarital counseling is encourage them like, okay, however much time you guys have before the wedding, okay, you're living together, you're sleeping together, we know it. We're not gonna talk about it again, but for like two months, go, go this way for two months and then come back together and read your Bible together to put the fire out if you have to. Try to encourage them to do that, but I don't, I don't do any follow-up because I don't want to embarrass people. Maybe I should, I don't know. Uh, encourage them to do this and then, okay, on the wedding night come together and I tell everybody read Song of Songs because it's what it's about. And so do that before they come together and get married, just to uh, build up an anticipation and to get their mind right around what they're getting ready to do. Maybe it's a little old fashioned. I mean, it is, it is God's way, but those are all hard conversations to have because it's so normal for everybody to live together before they get married now. Uh, but that's another thing we can do with our, with our young people, with our children, with our grandchildren. Whoever, you know, when you get an ear to listen, sometimes the moment is just right to breach these subjects. And there's no, okay, these are the signs to know the time is right. You'll just have a feeling that maybe it's time I can talk about this with them. And if they hear it from enough people, enough good Christian people, maybe we can change the attitudes back to the way it was. Or make them feel really guilty. Yeah, and I mean... On the other hand, you can't just bludgeon people with the law. The law, the law, the law. Uh, I mean, they need to hear the law until they repent, but they, they still need to know that there's some gospel at the end. So, yeah, this is not easy. Uh, and that is what the psalmists always do when they're talking about it. You know, it's okay with all my heart I have sought you. Don't let me wander from your commandments, verse 10. Okay, I mean, that's exactly what we do, not just with sexual matters, but with all the, all the sins against neighbor, all those things on the second table, you know, coveting, you know, adultery, coveting, coveting, coveting is probably the biggest one, um, stealing, stealing time, not necessarily stealing things, 
And then fearing, loving, and trusting God above all things, the first table. You know, if we're blatantly ignoring the way God tells us to live with our fellow man, then are we really fearing, loving, and trusting God above all things, first commandment? No, it all winds up going back to that first commandment. So the psalmist says, with all my heart I've sought you, don't let me wander. So we also have to encourage, and we have to pray for these people too, not just talk to them, we have to pray for them, encourage them to pray for these things, to have the strength, the self-control to pass by some of these temptations. And then when you fall, to repent. Because we will fall, we're, we're humans, that's what we do now, is fall, we repent, and we pick it back up and try again. But those are all hard conversations that we have to have. And I don't think it matters what age we are, we still have those temptations to break these commandments. We don't suddenly become holy once we turn 80. You know, would that it would be like that, but it's not. I think what happens is we get older and we just realize, yeah, I really am a poor, miserable sinner and I really do need that forgiveness that Christ brings to me. Uh, that's what maturity as a Christian is. Yeah, we get maybe a little better. We're, we don't fall into these habits we had in our youth, but we learn new bad habits. Yeah. That's just every stage of life, I think you have different things. I don't know. I'm doing a lot of talking, so. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, New King James Version. Mm -hmm. And uh, verse 10, and the second line, it says, Oh, with a comma, let me not wander from your commandments and an explanation for it. Yeah. <laughs> New King James is a good translation, by the way. It really is. I mean, you can hear the intensity of, you know, the, the, of the statement. Yeah, actually, since I can't read Hebrew, I don't <laughs> think I'm ever going to have time to take it up, maybe someday. But I do like, especially the Psalms, I do like to read the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, number one, um, Jesus quotes it all the time when he quotes Scripture. When they're quoting Scripture in the New Testament, they're quoting the Greek Old Testament. So mm -hmm. if you go to our Old Testament translated from Hebrew, and it's like, why doesn't it match? Because one one's quoting from Greek and the other one is Hebrew. That's why that happens. Uh, so I like to look at these Psalms sometimes just to see what it might have different, but I didn't look yet tonight at this one. Oop. Verse 10. Yeah, how do I keep my way straight? Or how, yeah, how shall a younger man keep his way straight? By the keeping of your words. And then it's interesting. It says, you know, don't let me wander from your commandments. It says, uh, you should not abandon me an exceeding amount, is what it actually says. So it's like, okay, you shouldn't abandon me an exceeding amount. It's like, okay, you're gonna give me, you're gonna give me some rope <laughs> but don't, don't give me too much because I'll just hang myself with it, right? So it's kind of interesting little subtlety. Okay, but... So I, I guess a big theme in this section is the power of our experiences, right? Because it's our experiences that shape us as adults. Uh, those experiences we have when we're younger. Um, so when you just surrender to every temptation, you have no willpower. And now trying to, even when you learn, okay, that behavior is wrong, I don't want to repeat that behavior, but it's much more difficult to resist that behavior once you've succumbed to it, right? So it's really easy to swear like a trucker, especially if you work in a machine shop, right? It's bad language is a thing. I mean, it's, I once listened to a guy that was able to use a particular dirty word as all eight parts of speech and do it grammatically correctly. He was such a master at it. So learning not to swear because it just falls off, falls out of your mouth. Learning not to do that is really hard when you get used to doing it. Those are hard habits to break. 
all habits are hard to break. But they say it takes you two weeks to pick up a new habit, good habit. I did this in a sermon once. And it takes you two weeks to break a bad one. Um, I think it might take more sometimes. But So every time you surrender to temptation, the next time surrendering to it is going to be a little easier and a little easier. So it gets harder and harder and harder to break those habits because they become wired into our brains. And you have to, again, you have to replace them with a new habit. This is turning into like a self-help thing. I'm not sure I wanted to do that, but, but it's kind of what it's talking about. Uh, so if you can replace the old habit with a new habit, that is a positive way to go about it. In a way, one pastor, professor of mine put it, because when you are, when you feel yourself succumbing to the temptation, whatever it is, but let's call it cussing, okay? So, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic and you want to drop an F-bomb. He says, memorize scripture verses and have them at the tip of your tongue when you feel the temptation. And so it's okay, now and you pray that piece of scripture whatever it is, maybe probably be a verse from a psalm uh, or just lead me not into temptation from petition of the Lord's Prayer. But have those Bible verses ready as ammunition. So when you're getting ready to fall off the edge there and do this thing that has become a habit, if you, he says if you recite those Bible verses enough, that will strengthen you spiritually to help you resist. Plus, you've changed the track your mind was on, if nothing else. So you automatically just, you know, shift the gears in your brain. You're not on cussing mode. Now you're on reciting Sunday school mode. And that just takes you away from that habit. And do it enough times, uh, the habit, the temptation, uh, one, becomes not as great. And then it doesn't, just doesn't come. Um, and if you've ever stopped swearing you also know it is very easy to pick it back up again you know the first time you let it slip the next thing you know it's going to slip more and more we wind up trying to justify it too like oh yeah I you know. and again you know we can blame society on that too look at the things they're allowed to say on tv now that you don't even blink an eye that they say it it's like you know remember when they couldn't say that on tv or you know, certain words, if it was like a live performance, they would get fined like this huge fine uh, for letting one instance of this uh, pop onto the air. And now it's just like, what is it that they're not allowed to say? And not even with cable, like with network TV. So as a society, we've decided that those words aren't bad. Um, and Luther would probably argue with me because he was pretty salty himself. I think his favorite word actually was fart. He talked about that as ammunition against the devil. <laughs> you guys heard that story? Okay, so one of the things Luther with his table talk, and he had his little disciples that wrote down every word the guy said. So he's holding forth at the table. And he goes, you know, when the devil's assaulting you in bed, you just let loose with a, you know, a good fart and we'll drive him away. Like, okay, Martin. <laughs> You might want to stick to grace by faith alone. But yeah, he, he constantly, he was very earthy that way. It's kind of funny. But, uh, you know, in our society, that that's how you talk. That's how people talk, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the evolution of words. Irregardless is in the dictionary now, which makes English teachers, you see that twitch going every time someone says it. But now it's in the dictionary because we made it a word. It's a word now. Uh, can societies change back? Yes, they can. We actually talked about this in a, what was it in? I think it might have been one of our education classes, like how to teach the faith. We were talking about how if society is going this far south, can you ever steer it back? And it's, oh yes, it's happened before in history where you've seen society decline and then it kind of finds its way back. That's the first use of the law. God's first use of the law is to prevent chaos. Otherwise, if everything's permitted, it's every man for himself and we're all going to wind up eating each other or killing each other. That's what would happen. But God's natural law keeps it from devolving to that point. So again, 
we have to look at our own habits. We have to, you know, call on the Lord to strengthen us because obviously we can't do that ourselves, 100%. We need help. And then we have to encourage our children and our, our young people and anybody in our congregation that will listen to us that, you know, we can fix this. We can take the world back to a place where it maybe wasn't so decadent, maybe it wasn't so permissive. Um, at the very least in our own lives. Uh, interesting word, and it's because I'm using cheat notes on Hebrew, because again, I can't read Hebrew. Uh, but his words, where'd it go? The very first verse, verse nine, how can a young man keep his way? The word his way, way, uh, is talking about like the, the rut in the road that a wagon wheel makes. So I don't know if you've ever seen old roads um, where the gauge of the wagon wheels actually wears ruts into the road. Like in Pompeii, when they uncovered it, you could see it. There's like these two tracks. It's like, did they build the road that way? Kind of. And that was exactly the width of the wagon wheels so that it would stay on track, even though it was a road. And that word he's using here for way, the Hebrew is called gorak, uh, means a rut made by a wheel of a cart or a chariot. And that what we do in our youth sets our tracks for our adult life. We're, we're wearing that groove, and then that is the way we go. And of course, you know, we're hyper, harping on the young, but it's not just the young, it's all of us. Um, we all have our challenges to keeping God's commandments, living the life that is pleasing to him. But for the young, and particularly young men, these uh, carnal sins are the biggie because that's a powerful motiv motivator in our mind. Those chemicals in our brain, mind are strong, and very forceful. Uh, you know, like, teenager, why did you do that? Or what, I don't know. I mean, and I think literally the I don't know sometimes is because they don't know. It's just the hormones and everything kick you to a new point where you actually don't know what you're doing. Uh, and that's, again, digging, digging those ruts, this, this way that the psalmist is talking about. You know what you do and what you don't know why. Right. It's like, I know I did it, but I don't know why I did it. I was like, why did you jump off the why did you jump off the roof? I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time, right? And then we realize that this is the psalmist talking. Um, again, we don't know who wrote this one. Uh, and if God wanted us to know the David or whoever would have been at the top of the psalm, but we don't know. Uh, and I think sometimes that's on purpose, because this could be any young man. Is it necessarily a young man that wrote this psalm? Or is this a, young, a man later in life looking back on his youth? I don't know. It could be either. Uh, but this is the actual psalmist, the writer of the psalm writing, okay, how can a young man, me, keep a pure life? And so that's where we come around kind of full circle with this part of the psalm, talking about how we make our bodies a house for God's word. Because um, does New King James use take heed? Does it use the word heed? Uh, no. Uh, in which, which word? I'm not sure. No, my whole part, I, it's always, no, oh, let me not wander from your commandments. It doesn't say take heed. Let me go to 11. Your word I can get my heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't let me water from the things. Your word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Listen, are you okay? So the way we take heed of God's word, you know, a life of a God-pleasing life, a life of moral purity, which is what we're talking about tonight, doesn't happen by accident, right? It's got to be intentional. Uh, so 
if we don't take heed of God's word, now that natural path, that rut we're going to, to wear in is going to be toward the opposite. It's going to be toward impurity. It's going to be to uh, degradation, to degeneration, to chaos. It's going to break down all the good order in our lives. So the psalmist says we have to we have to do it according to God's word. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. So we have to take heed of God's word. Take it at its word. So our foundation is always in the word of God. That's the standard. So we know what is right, what is wrong, what is excessive permissiveness in society and what is you know when did we cross the line or when is something crossing the line and I know for so many people it's so hard with uh, even like movies watching movies like I love you know Marvel movies and things and you know some of those movies have themes and stuff that maybe should we be watching that and they always say well you know if you're looking at it with a discerning eye you can filter out that part of it and enjoy the movie and then, yeah that's true I mean, I've justified it to myself that way countless times. Like, one of my favorite comic book movies is Deadpool. Do not go home and watch Deadpool. It's got a lot of bad language in it. <laughs> but, yeah, you know. So, because that movie's hilarious. But, is, okay, is that the best thing for me to be watching? Probably not. Uh, but we rationalize it to ourselves. Well, it's entertainment. I'm not going to go talk that way. Just like, I'm not going to go do the things he does in the movie. Uh, sometimes I think we fall into trouble with that, don't we? When we start building these justifications. I don't know. God shows us a standard and then we try to edit it. But then God's word also shows us the reasons why he's done things this way. And that's, that's maybe the thing we don't talk about with people enough, with each other enough, is, okay, we know what's right and wrong, what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. But we'd always, th always think about why. And that was our favorite question when we were kids and your parents told you not to do something. You go, why? Because I said so. But God doesn't tell us just because he said so. He gives us the reasons. He shows us what society, what from our interpersonal relationships between man and wife, parents to children, and then family units in society, in cities, we see all of that throughout the pages of Scripture and when it goes right and when it goes very badly wrong. So he shows us the why, and we see the what happens when you don't. I mean, big example, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So you see cities wiped off the map for not following God's ways. All right, so it shows us the reasons why God wants us to do these things. It shows us that it's not easy. We have countless examples throughout Scripture showing us it's not easy to do this thing. That's what's so amazing, I think, about the Old Testament patriarchs is, you know, when you first study them in Sunday school, you're like these great men of old, right? And then as you get older, you go like, these guys are not that good. They're deeply flawed and outright evil sometimes. David, like King David slays Goliath. He's the same guy that kills this guy because he wants to steal his wife. It's the same guy, but we don't bookend that story together in his life sometimes. Like all of these guys were very deeply flawed. So we see not only how difficult it is to keep God's law, but also um, what happens when you don't. But it also shows us the blessings of keeping it, um, which in turn shows us how to make sacrifices. Which, again, in our society today, that's not something we like to do, right? It's all about me. And, yes, I'll say it's about me. Because I'm pretty important in my life. <laughs> and I want things to be easy for me. Uh, I don't like sacrificing. you got to be kidding me. I, uh, this is something I heard not too long ago. And I want to be what we do are in the who we are are like links of a chain. 
mm -hmm. and they used the word, got an acrostic for the word chain. C is choice, A is, H is habit, A is attitude, I is instinct, and N is nature. I like that. I'm, I'm going to steal that for chapel next year for the kids. <laughs> so that's chain, I like that. I've never heard that one before. And it follows when you... Okay, you know, so what are they again? I'm sorry? What, what are they again? C is what? C is choice. Yeah, choice. H is habit. A is attitude. I is instinct. And N is nature. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely stealing that. that, that that's a good illustration for them. And I think, I think one of the most encouraging things for us is being shown the difficulty of doing all this stuff because, you know, it, not that it's okay when you fall, it's, it's okay, try again, you know, uh, it's more of, it reminds you to be on your guard because, you know, you have to just see some of this stuff coming sometimes uh, or, or encourage and help other people to see it coming because sometimes they're blind to it in their own lives. Any questions or comments from that point on? You know, we dwell so much on the young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're very right about that. So I wonder, is it middle-aged people have it the worst because you still have the stuff that affected you in your youth that makes you want to sin, and then you're starting to have the stuff that the older folks have, so you like have it from both directions at once? Or are they just so busy working you don't have time for this? Yeah, that one. <laughs> that one? Okay. I thought you'd like that one. Great. That could be, that could be. You know, they say, and, and I don't know. What did she say? That, that we have too much time on our hands sometimes. Oh, who? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, studying history with folks, it's always, it's always interesting to find out that, oh, yeah, people in the Middle Ages, you know, they had to work their fingers to the bone just to have a living, and, you know, and they didn't have time for anything. They had more free time than we do, which, and they have, like, less stuff to do with the free time. We have too many choices, I think, for our free time. But they actually had time to spend with family, time to gather around. They, they've proven that they had more free time than we do. But I think we make it that way with our work schedules and whatnot. And I think we turn our work into idolatry sometimes. Uh, but yeah, on the other hand, you might be right that we have too much time on our hands to think about well, I'm stuff. I'm thinking of teenagers way too much time on our hands. Oh, yeah, I, I have no doubt you're right about that. And then I think once you're retired, you just have too much time. That could be, that could be. Unless you're a motivated person Yeah, I, th I think another thing we have in society is that our entertainment and our downtime, we've turned into as mindless as we can make it. And I know I'm guilty of that too. It's like, okay, I just want to watch like the dumbest movie so I don't have to think. But is that really doing you any good? Probably not. It's probably rotting my brain. Uh, but, you know, people used to, you know, go outside and play and use their imaginations and stuff like that. And, and now it's okay. All of a sudden gaming became cool. Like we used to get made fun of for playing video games. Now all of a sudden everybody does it and it's cool. And that's all they do. They like never leave. There's a high cork shoes. Hmm? High cork shoes. High cork shoes, there we go. Yeah. They're uh, Spire, the athletic, mm -hmm. they actually have given scholarships 
to kids who do nothing but game. Oh yeah, there are professional gamers, which and, that's got to be yeah, a neat game. And they make get millions. Uh, they all get their sponsors, or you know, Coca Cola will ask mm -hmm. them, just, just set a can of Coca Cola by your desk. You know, and they get paid millions of dollars for that. You know. So this kid makes, you know, he spends his life playing video games and getting well paid for it. But see, the thing with that is, it's like anything else, too. It's like when we look, used to look up to sports heroes, too. But it's like, how many kids get to be that sports hero, be that football player, be that basketball player, be the gamer, be Tony Hawk and skateboard for your whole career? You know, very, very few make it to those that level. But then they spend all this time and energy aspiring to it. And for what? I don't know. Like, I've got one kid at the other church. It's every Sunday at basketball tournaments. It's like, dude, you are never going to be in the NBA. I get that you like basketball, but every Sunday for years, your parents are running you around to this stuff for what? I mean, you're not going to play ball in college. I know he's not going to play ball in college. It's not going to happen. I might be pleasantly surprised, but I'm telling you it's not going to happen. He's not tall enough, first of all. But it's, is that a good use of your energy? And that's, is that a good use for the parents' energy? And resources and plus they're never in church so <laughs> I don't know it's just me ranting okay just so real quick so God's Word shows us how to be born again and sometimes I think we have to be born again and again and again every time we are forgiven uh, it shows us how we can have how do we obtain the spiritual resources to to uh, aim for this pure life, this God-pleasing life. Again, God's Word shows us where that comes from. And then God's Word is a refuge against temptation, like we talked about earlier. Uh, a way to escape the, whatever it is that's enticing us to leave the path. Uh, and then God's Word is a light that burns off the fog, that, that seductive tempting fog of whatever it is again that's trying to lead you off the path what did they call those things in legend it was like in ireland and stuff in the in the bogs uh, they were like fairy lights or something but they would have lights in the in the uh moors and the lights would lure people out and then they would get stuck in the in the moor and they would like die they would drown they couldn't get out it's like quicksand i forget what they were called some kind of uh yeah, there's some kind of like fairy being or something. Maybe. Yeah, that might be it. It's kind of like a gnome. Something, some kind of little cre supernatural creature like that that they had in their legends. But, uh, you know, God's word is the light that burns that fog off so you can see, oh, I'm heading into the tar pit, not, not the road. And then God's word, again, is a mirror second use of the law, probably the most important use of the law, the mirror that shows you, okay, here's you. I don't like looking at myself in the mirror because I see myself as I am. I'm a sinner. Uh, it shows you where you're at. It shows you that you are a poor, miserable sinner. Not to condemn you, but to turn you to the one who can fix you. You can begin to begin again to repair that damage that sin does to us. Forgiveness. And then God's word is simple. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. But like Second Timothy two twenty two, I got a note here: flee youthful lusts. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, right? You know, simple, wise commands that sometimes we need to just put everything else away and read some simple, wise scripture. And maybe we try to attach too much to it. Maybe we just need to just read it. And then, of course, God's word can also wash us. Wash the act of the act of reading God's word also gives you the Holy Spirit, which also gives you it's a means of grace. It gives you forgiveness of sins. It turns your mind to repentance, and then you see you read the gospel that yeah, Jesus died for that too. And then again, God's word is the key to renewing our minds or our mindset. I would say our our worldview. Sometimes, as a society, our worldview is all about consumption. In this it's about consuming something, whether it's a product or what we put into our bodies 
or what goes into our eyes or ears, uh, whatever. Sometimes we need that word to recalibrate our mind to uh, begin that transformation within ourselves. And again, you know, and of course, this is all great advice, but are we going to be able to do it tomorrow? No. That goes back to the first part, that this is not easy. This is something that we do every day for the rest of our life. That's what carrying the cross is. Carrying the cross is knowing that you are going to struggle against sin. Knowing that God doesn't like this. But the good part is, again, Christ died for that as well. And Jesus said in John 5, 3, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And then in the high priestly prayer, John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. That's probably a good place as any to stop tonight. Is that, that, I, that high priestly prayer is something to do Bible study on just by itself. There's so much he had in there. But um, Spurgeon, uh, the great preacher man, supposed to be the greatest preacher that ever lived. It, you need a dictionary when he preaches. He said, young man, the Bible must be your chart, and you must exercise great watchfulness that your way may be according to its directions. You must take heed to your daily wife, as well as study your Bible, and you must study your Bible that you may take heed to your daily life. That's that circle, which is true. With the greatest care, a man will go astray if his map misleads him, but with the most accurate map, he will still lose his road if he does not take heed to it. So, yeah, he was a great preacher because that's packed with meaning what he said right there. So, the Bible has to be our chart. We have to watch it, take our direction from it. But then we also have to use it in our daily life. And then we use, in our daily life, we turn to Scripture. And if our map misleads us, we'll get lost. But even the most accurate map will not get you where you're going if you don't ever look at it. So if we don't dust that Bible off in our families, and maybe that's something we should all work for, work toward uh, family devotion time or daily devotion time with a friend or whatnot, so it's not just you alone, because that can get us in trouble sometimes too. But I'm going to stop talking. Though. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a lot for a few verses, but the Psalms make you think. They, they seem simple, and then we just start exploring what it's saying, and your mind can go to all kinds of different things. That's the way it works. That's why they're the church's prayer book. Any questions? We'll go to the next section next week. Uh, oh, that's where we'll stop then. We'll join together in the Lord's Prayer tonight. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.